our learning objectives, we're going to review cases where, you know, MitraClip now, as far as the process or the procedure has gone through lots of different terminology changes, TMVR, we sometimes just say MitraClip, but obviously that's trade name. So we're going to use transcatheter edge-to-edge repair as the terminology for MitraClip, which is T-E-E-R. Um, and so we're going to look at cases where that might be utilized and understand the importance of uh, echocardiography as far as the planning and implementing of the procedure. We're going to start with a clinical case. This is a 94-year-old gentleman. He's got class 4 dyspnea. Blood pressure's okay. Heart rate 74. He's got crackles in both lung fields. A holosystolic murmur at the apex, lower extremity edema, and unfortunately has an elevated creatinine and an elevated NT pro BNP. He, I won't show you the trans thoracic, but he went to TEE, which shows this large jet of eccentric mitral regurgitation. It's, it's coming all the way around. It probably has a quanta effect if I show you that. And on 3D imaging, again, surgic, surgeon's view. So we are looking, we are standing in the left atrium, looking down on that uh, mitral valve. Aorta's up here at the top. Anterior, the left atrial appendage, you can see it over here. So this is lateral. Here is medial. And here's posterior. So I labeled your uh, scallops here of the posterior leaflet, P1, P2, P3. We can see here the P2 uh, scallop is prolapsing quite a bit. And there's some small torn cords there as well. This is the ventricular aspect. Why is this important? Well, look at this that you see right here. There's a cleft-like indentation between the scallops. Now, when you flip it over the way this uh, machine does it, you sort of flop it right over. So this now is... P3 over here, and you can see this cleft-like invitation between P2 and P3, which is a very important thing uh, uh, to recognize for both surgical mitral valve repair as well as percutaneous. He had a mean gradient of 3 at a heart rate of 88 and a valve area of greater than 4. So you don't have to answer this question because I think I, I know what everybody's going to answer, but this is what we're going to be talking about when we see patients like this with severe mitral regurgitation. Should they undergo surgery? Are we going to do medical therapy or are they MitraClip? Now, this guy was 94, but until the week prior, he was gardening, very active. He was the primary caregiver for his wife, who was still alive, and he wanted to beat his dad's record of living to 107. So he had a lot of years he thought he still had left in him. And when we talk about surgical uh, risk, his STS score for repair was pretty high, 18%, the driver being his age and his renal disease. So very high risk patient, right? So this is the person that you would think about for MitraClip. And in 2013, we got approval for the MitraClip for organic or degenerative mitral regurgitation. So it's indicated for the percutaneous reduction of significant symptomatic mitral regurgitation, so greater than or equal to 3 plus. It didn't have to be 4 plus. And again, due to primary abnormalities of the valve, so again, degenerate or organic mitral regurgitation in patients who had been deemed to be too high of a risk for mitral valve surgery by a heart team, which includes a surgeon as well as a cardiologist with expert in valve disease, and that they didn't have other comorbidities that they would die from sooner than that. So this came out in 2013, and it came out because of the Everest II trial. So the Everest II, this was the, their four-year results. They had five-year results as well, but compared MitraClip to uh, open uh, surgical repair. And if you looked at three to four plus mitral regurgitation, here mortality similar to, to surgery. So MitraClip was great. It was equal to surgery. It reduced the mitral regurgitation. This was only looking at 48 months. It reduced it not as much as surgery did, but we clearly no longer had severe mitral regurgitation or that much three plus mitral regurgitation. And again, this was reported in 2013. If you look at the population though in Evers 2, this is important because we use this, you know, we're doing mitral clips, but if you look at what Evers to what the patients look like in that study, the mean age was in the mid 60s. They had a 30% were, were over that, over 75, mostly men. They didn't have a lot of comorbidities other than heart failure. Again, they were symptomatic mitral regurgitation, so of course heart failure. But if you looked at their comorbidities, there was about a quarter percentage, you know, quarter, 25% uh, mostly kind of average everything of comorbidities. Only 8% had diabetes, not that much COPD, and their EFs were 60%. So this was a very specific population in, in Evers too. So people said, okay, so once this came out, of course, you know, cardiologists, we love new toys. So we wanted to do MitraClip. So people said, okay, let's look at real life experience. Okay, that was Evers too. But what are we doing when we're putting MitraClip in? And this looked at the STS uh, uh, ACC TVT registry report, looking at 
what was happening between 2013 and 2015 on the patients that were getting MitraClip. And on this registry, there was a little under 3,000 patients. It was half and half, male, female. The age, 82. Very different than Everest too, right? So this was almost 20 years older. They did have elevated CT uh, risk scores, 6.1% uh, for repair, higher for replacement, but very high success when they looked at this. 92% success with only an in-hospital mortality of 2.7%. And what we saw was that there was a significant reduction in mitral regurgitation in these patients. The majority had less than two plus mitral regurgitation, 93%, and really almost 70% had less than mild or had mild or less regurgitation. So profoundly beneficial reduction. And we know that having more than moderate mitral regurgitation is a bad prognostic thing, no matter whether you do surgery or clip. But it's important to recognize that when they looked at this, the primary pathology that was seen was at A2P2. So about 80%, the pathology was at A2P2. And 30% required two clips, which was not what Everest II looked like. So again, you do need to recognize that it requires a little bit more, and this is an older population. Okay, but again, so this shows you the benefit of MitraClip. So our patient is going to go for MitraClip. And we'll talk now about the procedural uh, indication or the procedural process for MitraClip placement. And this is a great procedure for an echocardiographer because you actually are in the cath lab with the interventionalist, and they actually listen to you which is an awesome feeling, right? They actually look at you and say, what do you think about that positioning? I don't know, it's a great high for me. So one of the important parts is that transeptal puncture. So what we do is we look at it from a, um, a superior and inferior uh, view. So this is at the bicaval view, so SVC over here. So this gives you superior, inferior. We put an X-plane through that and give you anterior and posterior. The goal for that transeptal puncture is, is a superior and posterior, right sort of at the fossa of ovalis. So we want to be going right there for this particular procedure. When the, the interventionalist sort of tents it, see how you see that tenting, we want to freeze that, look at that tenting, draw a line down to the mitral annulus when the valve is open, and we measure that distance. And we want it around four centimeters. And sometimes we want it a little bit bigger. We don't usually want it much shorter than that. So on average, it's about four centimeters. And why is that important? Well, the steerability of the mitral clip, you, just, you need enough height to get down to the valve and get proper positioning. And again, on, um, when we do these uh, procedurally, we flip back and forth between 2D and 3D imaging all the time. A lot of us like to stay on 3D, but the interventional cardiologist will say, go back to 2D, so we go back and forth. Here's the sheath, so we, we pop across the, the fossa, we put a dilator in, and then the sheath goes in. And here you can see the sheath coming across. Again, surgeon's view coming across the atrial septum and heading down, it looks like it's pointing down towards the valve. As we get that guidance down to the valve, the mitral clip comes out of the sheath. We actually watch the clip coming out of the sheath to make sure that it's not abutting against the lateral wall of the left atrium. We want to make sure that it's free within the middle part of the LA. And then we watch the clip coming down towards the valve here. And here it's actually through the valve. Here's the clip through the valve. Really important part of the process, and this is where 3D, we do it all with 3D, is positioning that clip the right orientation. That can really be missed on um, a fluoroscopy. Again, the heart's a three-dimensional structure. These patients might have big hearts. The anatomy might not tell you on fluoroscopy the exact positioning of that clip. So on 3D, we can tell you this is not right, right? So this clip positioning is not going to grab you your A2P2 scallops. And here, we've they've turned it, and we have the appropriate positioning. Now, as we head towards the valve, we're looking at where that mitral regurgitation jet is. And again, so we'll go back to 2D, and we want to see that we are positioned right where that severe leaking jet is. And this we always do on 2D. We look at where the, the clip grasps the leaflets. And this is done in the long axis view. And we look, there's the anterior leaflet. So this is the 120 or higher in our TE degrees. There's anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet, and I don't show it on this one, but what we're looking for is getting both the anterior and posterior leaflet in the grip arms. Now, with the newest mitra clip, the grip arms are independent, so the arm will come down and grasp the anterior leaflet and can grasp the posterior leaflet independently, and this is where minor tweaks the interventional cardiologist will do, and we'll tell them if we see both of those 
uh, the posterior and the anterior leaflet appropriately clipped by those clip arms. Sometimes we'll only see the anterior leaflet clip, but not the posterior. So we help guide this uh, quite a bit to make sure we have that because we need to get both parts of the valve. We need the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet. And for our patient, we got that anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet. We look for a bridge, a tissue bridge, meaning we got enough anterior leaflet and posterior leaflet and the clip is solid in position with enough of both leaflets. And in this patient, we got that, but there was still significant mitral regurgitation seen here medially. So the decision was made to make uh, place clip number two. And here's clip number two coming down. Here it is going here. It gets deployed. And this is our beautiful result where we got, an, it's a wide tissue bridge for sure, but we have this owl's eye appearance. This again looks like what an alfieri stitch will look like from a surgical perspective. And we see, yes, there's mitral regurgitation, but far less. And our interventional cardiologists will always be looking at LA pressures. And we see, whoa, that V wave is gone. LA pressure has improved markedly. So wow, this is awesome, right? So this patient does very well. But important to recognize that when we're doing TEE, there's things that we look at to determine the success of MitraClip. And in the Evers criteria, we'll go back to this because it's important to recognize this came out, right? Best thing since sliced bread, awesome procedure, didn't have to go to open heart surgery. But there was some very specific criteria for Evers II in the MitraClip. Ideally, we wanted that regurgitation at that middle scallop, A2P2. You needed a mitral valve area greater than four. This, this patient population had EFs greater than 25%. Their LVs were not huge. They could go up to 55 millimeters, but not bigger. A flail gap of less than 10 millimeters, a flail width less than 15, and a coaptation length of uh, greater than or equal to two millimeters, and a coaptation depth of 11, less than 11. And I'll show you what some of these numbers look like. So this is what the flail gap was that was identified. And again, this is in uh, organic or uh, degenerative mitral regurgitation. So it's that flail leaflet, right? So we freeze it. We usually do it from the long axis view. And we measure that distance, and we do it during this uh, systole. So that's you know that's where the mitral regurgitation jet's going to take off, and we measure that gap. So we look at that particular number. The flail width can be done in two different views: either the um, uh, transgastric short axis, looking at that uh, width, or I like the commissural view, where we measure again the flail gap width. The other important thing is calcification. Remember, we're grabbing the leaflets. So if there is calcification where you're grabbing, that's not gonna really take well to that, those clip arms. So we really wanna look to see if there's calcification at those grasping areas. So of A2 and P2, we look at sort of that distal seven millimeters, and that's for the NT clip. We can talk a little bit about the multiple clips that are now available, but the, the first generation NT clip. We're looking at about seven centimeters, that distal end of either the anterior or the posterior leaflet to see if there's calcification. Now on TE, it can be rough. It can look echo bright. Is that calcification? Sometimes we're wrong and we think it's calcification and it's actually valve thickening. So really important to look at that very closely because you might say, oh yeah, there's calcification, this might not go well, but it's actually more fibrosis and thickening, which is hard on echo to differentiate. The co-optation depth and length, where actually this is more for functional mitral regurgitation, where you'll see this, where the, where the leaflets touch each other, that's the co-optation length right there. And then the depth is sort of how deep the valve meets or co-ops in the LV, and we measure that this way. So all of those numbers, this, we were doing this, I mean, we had this huge checklist when we were doing TEs of all these things we needed to do to get to, to do this. But it got simpler and simpler because the interventional cardiologists started doing more and more of these and they didn't really care as much about these numbers. Maybe that's not the right terminology. They were less worried about some of these numbers. But so kind of this came to our sort of suitability list. You know, what were the things that yes, this was good or no, this was bad. Again, if it was a single main jet, that's good. If there was no calcification, the valve area was big. That was all good. What was bad? Multiple jets that were all huge. The leaflets were calcified. If you had these cleft-like invitations, if you had an elevated gradient across the mitral valve or intracardiac mass or thrombus. That's been whittled down even further. And what do the interventionalists really want? This calcification is important. The valve area is important. And whether there's mitral stenosis and intracardiac thrombus. So this is sort of the, the key things that the, the interventional cardiologists want us to tell them when we do these TEs. 
We have to recognize, though, that the Evers criteria, not, you know, we talked about it, not everybody falls into those criteria. And there's a lot of patients that we send for MitraClip that don't have all those criteria and don't have this, quote, ideal valve for MitraClip. So we have to, you know, we have to make that, we, we have to recognize that. Again, the ideal is P2 scallop, no calcification, big valve, low gradient, a flail width less than 15, and a flail gap of less than 10. That's the Evers criteria. As any of those go out of whack, that valve becomes less likely to respond to, to a, a mitral clip. Doesn't mean they're not going to try it, but it may not have the best outcome. So I, as the echocardiographer, I'm very careful. I don't say on my TE report, not a candidate for mitral clip. They don't like that. I will just describe what I see, and then it can be decided whether what's the likelihood of success for this mitral clip. And why is that important? Well, if you look at if taking that Everest patient with all those criteria that we talk about and comparing it to a non-Everest patient, not having those nice things. Well, they do OK from a survival standpoint if you don't have that criteria. But look at what happens when we look at freedom from reintervention. If you don't fit nicely into that category, unfortunately, you're more likely to require more procedures down the road. That valve is just, it's not as ideal. So you are, unfortunately, have this potential of having to do more to that mitral regurgitation down the road. And that non averse patient, I showed you what um, that STS uh, 2017 study looked like and showed this marked reduction in mitral regurgitation. When now, as we do more and more sort of non classic patients, we see that the mitral regurgitation reduction, and this is in the longest follow up period uh, as the comparator, we see the non averse patient, there's still a fair amount of moderately severe and moderate regurgitation. So we don't get this long-term sustained benefit. And part of that is because, again, the non-Everest patient is more of that functional mitral regurgitation patient. It's not all just organic or degenerative mitral regurgitation. And this was a German, so this looked at a German registry because, again, the criticism is who we're putting mitral clips on, the vast majority are not that single flail leaflet patient who's got a normal EF who's 60 years old. It's a much sicker patient population. And in this German registry, it only had about 800 um, uh, patients, but they looked at multiple different sites of all the people that were getting MitraClip. And what they found that at four years, there's a 53% mortality still. So pretty high. So half your patients at four years are dying. And so this is not benign. But why is that? Well, look at the comorbidities and what are the predictors of mortality. A lot of these patients have had TAVR before or some other aortic intervention. Again, you're talking about 80 plus year old patients with lots of comorbidities. They have renal disease. They're in a worse New York Heart Association class. Their LVEF is poor. So again, the patient population that is getting the CLIP is a sicker patient. So we have to recognize that although we might reduce mitral regurgitation, we do improve six minute walks. They still have a significant disease burden and are not going to live forever. Let's look at a couple cases, an 83-year-old woman who has significant mitral regurgitation. She's quite short of breath, but she was felt to be too high risk. She had prior AVR. So peristernal long right here. You can see her mitral valve here. Zoom up on the mitral valve, thicken. She's in AFib. You see mitral anion calcification. Here's the mitral regurgitation. Male format, LV over here. Here's the mitral regurgitation. Again, visually looks severe. We're not going to get into quantitation of mitral regurgitation, but looks quite severe. The gradient across that valve was two millimeters of mercury. So the decision was made to proceed to MitraClip, and I actually met her during the interventional procedure. And this is her TEE. So again, four chamber, kind of a long axis, but off kilter. Mitral valve thickened. You don't see anything prolapsing. You don't see a flail segment. Here's the mitral regurgitation. Here's the long axis view. I wouldn't call there calcification at the, at the leaflet tips, but there is some thickening and fibrosis. Her LVEF was sort of low normal. Her aortic valve prosthesis was functioning fine. So my, the mitral regurgitation, it came out moderately severe quantitatively. Again, this is intubated in the cath lab. This is what the 3D looked like. You see mitral calcification sort of circling. And I got a valve area of 3.95 and a gradient here of three millimeters of mercury. So I got a little anxious. And I was like, oh, valve's a little bit small. I did it a few different times. I think I got maybe one that was a little above four. But on average, it sat right around four centimeters squared. 
So uh, the interventionist said, okay, let's just give it a try. So we get put a clip in, and this is before full deployment. We've just gotten the arms up, and we see, look at that, mitral regurgitation has gone down to mild, right? There's that little jet right there. So fantastic result in terms of mitral regurgitation. But we have a gradient of 12. So couldn't do it. There would be no reason to reposition this clip because if we repositioned it, we wouldn't have gotten the MR. So very important to recognize that you can't leave this. You cannot exchange severe MR for then severe MS. This patient is not going to do well with that. And a recent study showed that. This came out of Jace this year, showing that if you had a mitral valve gradient of greater than five after the procedure, it actually impacted survival. And what predicted this higher gradient? It was that valve area before. But how did you need to get that valve area? 3D that mitral valve area was critical. 2D parameters didn't seem to uh, help as much. The gradient pre didn't help as much either. It was really that mitral valve area by 3D. In addition, indexing that mitral valve area to body surface or stroke volume also seemed to be beneficial. So some things we really have to look at. And again, doesn't mean you're not going to try, but I think that the patient and everybody involved needs to recognize that you may not have success. And again, if you leave them with a high gradient afterwards, unfortunately, they may not do well long term. This is the next case, 60-year-old man who presents with worsening volume overload. He's had coronary disease. He's actively smoking. He's got a 100-pack year, a diabetic. He had had uh, short, of breath, short of breath six months ago, but then now lower extremity edema, orthopnea, PND. He's got pretty significant coronary disease. And here's ex his exam. His JVP is elevated. He's got a mitral regurgitation murmur at the apex and one plus lower extremity edema. He's on all the right medications, although maybe the doses aren't great. And here is his electrocardiogram. Here is his uh, transthoracic image. You can see the LV is big, quite big, dysfunctional. There, the mitral valve leaflet's quite tented. Remember, we talked about cooptation, depth, and, and length. You could see right there how they're meeting and the tenting. Here's the annulus, and there's the mitral regurgitation. And even here on the peristernal lung, quite severe. Here from the apical four chamber, Mayo format. Again, severe mitral regurgitation. LV is quite bad. Here's the two chamber. Look at the mitral regurgitation. And then looking at the tricuspid regurgitation here, RV was big as well and we have severe tricuspid regurgitation. So the LV, the summary on the echo was severely dilated LV, uh, end diastolic diameter of almost 70, EF calculated at 17%, bad cardiac index, severe MR, severe TR with RV dysfunction as well. So I'm gonna ask you guys, this is your question. Go ahead and poll. What do you wanna do with this guy? And I'll go ahead and start the polling. Surgical mitral valve repair and tricuspid, medical therapy, a CRTD, mitral clip, Viability, mitral clip plus tricuspid clip. Go ahead and vote. And are people voting? Okay, there we go. Okay, wait a few more. Come on. Come on, double digits. Okay, I think I will stop there. Let's see what you guys voted. Do I have to click again? I think, oh, there. Okay, so, oops, sorry. Oh, can I go back? Uh, sorry. Okay. So, wow, great spread. I, I, I like this. So, I'm glad a lot of you didn't say CRTD. The patient didn't have a left bundle, so wouldn't have met criteria. Um, a lot of you want to do uh, both mitral and tricuspid clip. Some just want to do the mitral. Some want to refer the guy. Um, and then others want to do viability. Viability wasn't done, but I will tell you that it was decided to do option six, which the majority of you wanted to do. Although he was only 60, it was felt that he was high risk for surgery. He didn't really want it, so the decision was go to go for mitral clip and tricuspid clip. Okay, so now I'll show you. I met him in the echo lab during the procedure. He's intubated. So here, four-chamber view. You could see bad LV. RV looks down, not terrible. Atria are huge. Here again, two-chamber view. The inferior wall is done. Here's the mitral regurgitation, central jet. We can see here, you can tell that there's actually a coaptation, like there's a hole, right? They do not coapt the mitral, uh, the, the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet. There's a space. And then if we look at the tricuspid regurgitation, quite severe. And I did some 3D, again, showing that lovely space there where there's no coaptation. And this is the ventricular side, and here's the color. So. 
Should we go ahead and go ahead with mitral clip and tricuspid clip? A lot of you said yes. Does this confirm what most of you said? Well, I was a little worried about this guy. And uh, they, you know, when we do these, the interventional fellows there, and I asked for some of the right heart cath numbers. Filling pressures were crazy high on this guy. And we looked back on his meds and we thought, you know what, maybe we should stop and admit him to the hospital and aggressively diurese him. And that's what we did. And when we did that, we got this after aggressive diuresis. So there's still significant mitral regurgitation, but look at the tricuspid regurgitation. It's mild now. And remember that space that was there before? The leaflets are now co-opting better. So he underwent just a mitral clip and no tricuspid clip at all. And I think this shows you the importance of the co-op study. So now we've gone into functional mitral regurgitation, right? And again, a lot of the studies I showed you included functional mitral regurgitation. But here in COAP, this came out 2018, patients with class two to four heart failure, they had three to four plus mitral regurgitation, EFs from 20 to 50%. They were on all the best heart failure meds, right? So you had to go to a heart failure doc. You had to be on all the right meds. There had to be discussion about upgrading to a BIV uh, ICD if you meet, met criteria. And you were excluded if you had a huge heart. And wow, look at this, look at the device group. I mean, look at how much better they did, right? This was awesome. However, in that same New England Journal, we had this, the Mitra FR. So this was the European equivalent. Now look here, EF 15 to 40, their regurgitant numbers were a little different. They, didn't ha they were on meds, but it wasn't as well controlled, and they had no exclusion criteria. So apples and oranges a little bit for these studies. So if you look at that closer, that's exactly what you see. For the mitro FR, their ERO wasn't as large, so by classic criteria, weren't as severe by those numbers, but their hearts were bigger. So big hearts with slightly less MR. Versus COAPT, EROs were in that severe category and the hearts weren't as big. Procedurally, in mitro FR, there was worse outcomes with, uh, again, lots of mitral regurgitation after 12 months, different from the COAPT. So these are different studies. Doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong, but you have to recognize this. So this came from the European Heart Journal talking about, what, you know, should everybody just get a clip if they have severe MR? Well, really, clip, clip is useful if you have severe MR by criteria and your LV is bad, but not too bad. That's when it's really useful. If the LV gets really bad and really huge, even if you have severe MR, it's not clear that mitral clip is gonna do you a ton of good, certainly not long term. And then if the uh, MR is not that severe by criteria, it doesn't seem like CLIP makes any sense for that other category. Those people have more problems with their LV. So the current valve guidelines, this is the recommendation 2A for patients with chronic severe secondary MR related to LV dysfunction who have persistent symptoms despite all the right medicines, then doing a mitral clip is reasonable uh, as long as you've gone through all these different things that we talk about and you exclude, you have the right anatomy and you have this EF, the heart's not that big and you don't have severe pulmonary hypertension. And then 2B here with chronic severe MR related to LV dysfunction who have persistent symptoms while on this, you could still consider mitral valve surgery, but it's a 2B. So in summary, how to approach severe mitral regurgitation. First of all, you need a careful systemic, systematic approach to the uh, mitral regurgitation. We didn't talk about quantitation, but very important. You want to review class one and class two recommendations to proceed to mitral valve intervention. Think about surgical versus percutaneous options. If the surgical risk is high, assess feasibility for mitral clip. And we talked about those things on TEE. The big ones, mitral valve area and calcification, I think are very critical. Remember, for functional MR, think of that LV and get on maximal uh, medical therapy and identify other things that might be going on that maybe you could fix first before going to a mitral clip and recognize that, unfortunately, we can't fix everybody with a mitral clip. Thank you very much for your time and attention.